All right, hey guys, uh, my name's Taylor Halsmans. Uh, I go by Polis Arcticus online. And I'm more of a technologist. I do a lot of Solidity program, a lot of distributed systems programming. This talk is gonna be a bit more philosophical, um, but I just wanna lead with a solution more so than the problem. Um, so I titled my talk, uh, Observing Together, uh, Co-Creation as the Missing Ingredient for Data Sustainability. Um, now to show an example, uh, this is online today. I call it Obsidian DSI. Uh, it's got over a thousand downloads so far. Uh, and more than five times the people have chosen to just fork it themselves and extend it. This brings Web3 uh, into a scientist native stack. Uh, so if you wanna see an example of where I think I'm going with this, uh, feel free to go take a look at this. Uh, you can pull IPFS content, you can do protein folding with edge compute, uh, and f in the future, much more. Now, technologically, data sustainability is really trivial. Like, they had this figured out thousands of years ago. Like, you just take some clay, put in what you want, fire it, you know, have a nice little cipher littered around, and your data will weather cataclysms. Whether or not you want that data to be found again is a different story, um, but that's pretty much it. Um, in fact, if you showed Ethereum to an Akkadian or a, or a Babylonian, they probably would have thought, oh, you took exactly our ideas, uh, but you turned it into a computer. Uh, kind of what they would dream about, I imagine. However, and I've heard it a lot in this room, sociologically, data sustainability is anything but trivial. There's been countless book burnings through the ages, and an unfortunate amount of academics who have lost their lives trying to sustain data. Natural disasters, the English that we even speak today is fundamentally different 100, 200, 300 years ago. Like, has anybody read Gauss? Like, let alone like Isaac Newton. Like, even wading through the S's or like the little squiggly lines is difficult. And like, like, let's not even get into so, like, we'll get into later. <laughs> like, even how it's, this is accelerating in the post internet world. Conquest is the major one, the burning of Library of Alexandria. The famous Tigris running black with the ink from the Mongols. Culture wars. Now, I can find any single civilization on this planet right now who's engaged in this. So just take your pick, right? And technological suppression. If we want to get down into the root of why academia is so politically charged, it's so that we're at this point, it doesn't matter if you go left, right, up, down, or straight. You're running into probably some sort of mass war, like, weapon of mass destruction. So if you wanna ask why it's political, like go open Bertrand Russell's book, The Scientific Society. So I think it's really safe to say that society, culture, and data have a really tepid relationship. It's like, this goes back to what it means to even be human, right? One of my favorite quotes is from Cormac McCarthy's The Cooley Problem. They explore like what it means to have man in language, human in language. Does it meet some need? Right, it's like, why do we even bother using numbers and letters in the first place, right? Like, why do we even challenge this idea? Like, every other mammal is doing fine without it. He quotes in his example, we've had to like, basically go through like, generations and generations of guttural changes that have made it really risky to like, even chew food just for language. And even afterwards, we kind of go through this culture that knowledge is everything. Like, forgetfulness takes entropy. Is it not a feature for the animal to actually be able to forget information effectively? So I think it's really summed up well by Marshall McLuhan and John Calkins' quote. Um, and I'll be mentioning him a couple times because uh, we're both born uh, in the same city, uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, is that we become what we behold. Like our tools shape us and thereafter the tools begin to shape us. So I wanna like leave an open question to everybody. It's like, who are we to decide? what technology gets used by other people. And that's really wanna, where I wanna come from today. So at the beginning, changing mediums and reinterpretations, right? Coming back to language, it's like how many people have ever questioned what happened to the word awful and awesome, right? Like awful should be full of awe. Awesome, like some awe, but somehow the linguistics got changed. <sighs> Leonard Bernstein says it, poetry has shown, began to show a remarkable degradation in syntax. 
phonology is taking over, right? The syntax is a vague memory. And so when we see Gen Zs, like phoneticisms online, it's being birthed in the places of the internet. School is beginning to look like Terrence Howard's picture in his book. It's like you're going up and you're seeing this kind of exclusion game where knowledge becomes this sort of like prize commodity that we compete over. And I, I dare to say as trust becomes, we're living in a globalized society, most of us grew up in high trust cultures, it's gonna even out as globalism happens. So when, if trust is low, we gotta think about how we build long and broad knowledge structures instead of tall and often dark spires. Knowledge right now, since the birth of the printing press, has been cultivated in highly centralized circles, for better or for worse, right? Our technology has often dictated how information is exposed to the environment. Going back to the black box question, when inputs are hidden and tolerance of the function is hinges on exposed levels of trust. High trust in malicious functions can be just as bad as low trust in good functions. You see, sometimes it's almost advantageous to have 99% of your population being ultra good people, because if you're the 1% of psychopaths, it's more easier pickings. So currently, I like to define our world as a hub and spoke model. The world where downlink is a lot greater than uplink. One of my favorite kind of like attaches about this is 20 years after the printing press, we had the witch burnings. It's like, oh goodness gracious, what, would, what has happened 20 years after the global deployment of the internet? The short-term solutions have been band-aids, unfortunately. Individuals that have not fallen into this model, this intellectual like cartel, and for lack of a better word, has faced censorship, shadow banning, network partitioning. And to come from an individual's perspective, that's led to alienation, skewed discourse, and quite frankly, it exacerbates the tribalism is probably trying to avoid. I, I like to call it trust finance. It's that we're kind of borrowing trust from the future to burn now. And so uh, if that's a bit too hard, like we can see like David Aronchik's work, they have to have a white list of nodes. Otherwise we'd be exposing ourselves to how he defines uh, illegal or uh, questionable content. Individuals that have gone for open source solutions, such as Tornado Cash, have found themselves basically treated like they're part of the North Koreans, more so than they're actually part of the Western world. Individuals that have found themselves censored, shadow banning, get relegated to the unsavory parts of the net, where they become much more vulnerable uh, to agents looking to co-opt them. And so, tying back in together about what world we're coming in with big data, is that now it's not content that matters, right? It's context. And so as scientists, I think it's really tempting to try to answer that question about, you know, what data should be salient. Um, I don't think it's the job of science to ask that question. And I think the scientists are better off trying not to answer that question. Uh, but as an individual from the outside world, um, it's kind of the first question that you want to have answered. Uh, so this is a quote from, a really interesting video game in the 90s uh, that talks about the reshaping of big data and what we choose to look at as, as foundations to our culture, our information, and our society. Um, so thank you for letting me draw a little frame around that. Uh, I appreciate your time on that. Um, I'm here to talk more so about solutions and what we can do from this sort of angle. Uh, the first one being IP in IPFS is not for intellectual property. Uh, it's for interplanetary, which means one law, one set of common rules. Again, from the, from the Dark Spire perspective, we got to increase stakeholdership and data curation. So we want download to equal upload. Uh, I like drawing upon climate data, like with tools like WeatherXM. If someone doesn't want to trust the data, it doesn't matter how accurate your weather boy is in the middle of the ocean. But if they deployed it themselves, if they were able to build that weather station from scratch, suddenly you have somebody who's willing to engage in that data set and you have a whole community that's willing to do it. A lot of talk in the crypto space recently is about tying identity to information. And I'd like to postulate that there is something to be said about moving in the opposite direction. We talked about where the money is coming from and how that biases an individual's perspective on research. By leveraging pseudo-anonymity, we can cut through sea bono moral hazards. By reframing context generation, 
the next question, sorry, is about what do we do with context generation? In the hub and spoke model, it's really clear who generates the context, the open AIs, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Lockheed Martins. And I want to postulate something a bit different through something called the syncing of logical clocks. And I'll get into more of that in a moment. But to start, we'll talk about pseudo anonymity. One of the most powerful intellectual traditions that has graced this earth in the past 3,000 years is the Hermetic tradition. The Hermetic tradition is ascribed to a series of pseudo-anonymous scholars that all writ under an egregore called Hermes Trimagustus. And now you can debate it in the literature if you like, but some people say it's the foundation of the Abrahamic religions. And if we go into this literature, it also is regarded as a major peacemaking force during the Protestant and the Catholic reformations. So how can we bring this sort of synthetic ideology making in the increasingly globalized world. And I would like to say, if it's super important, take your name off of it. We don't need to be funding for these. It should be that if something is as important as climate change, we should be all be working for rice and bread instead of looking for a nice mortgage property. In regards to changing cultures in science, I'd really like to focus on the idea of not driving results but really prioritize relentlessness in the pursuit of your endeavor. We don't have to be looking to the Elsevers who are saying who gets to be cool, who gets to be not. We can look to each other and saying, hey, yeah, I don't have the solution, but you know what? I'm working really hard with this group of people to solve this open problem. Again, going back to that broad and tall knowledge structure. We can use citizen science to help target sociological alignment. By facilitating this amount of sociological buy-in, they had a civilization that didn't last the average lifespan of a fiat cycle. They, have a, they had a civilization that spanned thousands of years, and they managed to perform status quo ante every single year instead of every 60 or 70. And I think that in itself speaks proportions to what sociological buy-in for science can do. So the last point that I'd like to make is about exploring how we can collectively in a distributed system create our own context. And I'd like to propose that it's about forming the largest mesh of logical clocks. Now, for those unfamiliar with logical clocks, just programming time and chronological time is a really, really annoying thing as a distributed systems programmer. No one has the same clock. Everyone wants to game the clock system. Indeed, you go back to the Roman times, one of the major things they like to do is move the actual dates back and forth to roll over debt obligations. And so if we live in a system, in a logical clock, it doesn't matter about how many times your quartz crystal is ringing. It matters about the string of logical events that happened one after the other. All of us, in some sense, as we go through our day, are picking up correlations with other individuals, creating our own logical clock. Now, by stringing together the largest mesh of coherent logical clocks, we create our own natural context. In conclusions, I'd just like to say that all the politics, all like the crap that academics go through on a day-to-day -day basis, it's a really hard, really open problem, and it happens for a lot of good reasons. But we have different options when it comes to distributed systems. And thank you for the time on that.